Thank you everyone for coming out this morning to hear a part of my story and thank you to Creative Mornings and everyone that worked so hard to open up a St. Louis chapter. I am honored and humbled to be the first speaker in St. Louis. As Yavash said, I am Erica Brown. I'm the founder, artistic, and executive director of Consuming Kinetics Dance Company. Consuming Kinetics Dance Company is a 501c3 nonprofit professional dance company here in St. Louis. And in addition to our concert season, we also offer a full program of adult drop-in dance classes, which we heard a little bit about coming, but he wasn't terrible. He did a good job. And we also have a youth program where we raise students as artists from a concert dance style perspective in a non-competitive environment. So I'm here today to talk about my journey of founding CKDC um, in the context of my ideas about courage. Courage has many faces. If we employ it even just a little bit, it can take us on some incredible adventures. It took me a lot of courage to come here today after almost 10 successful concert seasons where I have been terrified to speak to our audiences before our shows. In high school and even in undergrad, I actually liked speech class. I um, loved to write and I was very outgoing, so it was a good combination. But after my academic career was over, my ambition was high, but I was met with some people who recommended that I didn't get myself into such risky business. And so I sometimes allowed other people to compromise my courage. It took me some time to cultivate my strength from within and find that strength not contingent on the acceptance of others. Pardon me. <laughs> when you have something big that can change people's lives or even the world, you're going to experience those who will be against you. But in the same breath, I must say that people, or as I refer to them, my community, are going to be your biggest support system. So I figured I would show you some pictures of our community. So let's rewind to my beginning. How do we deviate from the trajectory that life sets us on? Nobody gets to decide if they come to consciousness in a third world country, during a recession, to a mother who didn't make it through labor, or to a parent who's alone in their journey. I came to the world with a mom, a dad, and grandparents, but my time with my mother was very limited as she died before my sixth birthday. She had stage four cervical cancer and treatments couldn't save her life. At that age, I couldn't fully understand what happened to my mom, but I knew that we didn't get to see her again. And this sent my dad into a period of depression, but his parents took me in and helped raise me. I don't have many memories of my mother, but what I do have are quite a few memories of not having a mother. These feelings started around the age of 10 as our relationship with our parents slowly transitioned from caregiver to friend. And the void that I experienced grew. As a teenager, I was often really jealous of people that got to go out with their moms. My grandmother was already pretty elderly, and going to the grocery store was quite a feat enough, so I knew she wasn't going to have the stamina to hit the town with me. So my trajectory was aimed for destruction. Self-doubt, depression, the why me feelings. I was a victim. I had unhealthy relationships with men in my life because I was afraid of having to deal with loss again. And I found my way, but it wasn't without kicking and screaming. It wasn't without showing my ugly and learning things the hard way. But I had this dream of a life where I was connected and happy and independent. And I couldn't really articulate it, but it was there, a yearning. And I wouldn't have described it as courage, but I had the tenacity to work towards something against all odds. Maybe because I had nothing to lose and anything to gain. So I did what any sensible, soul-searching, meaning-of-life-chasing person would do. I went to college. Thank you for laughing at my joke. <laughs> Academically, I always had to work a lot harder to my peer, than my peers. Things didn't tend to come naturally to me, so I knew that I wouldn't be a good candidate for math or science. And I knew that going to college wasn't going to be an easy task. 
I knew that these academic shortcomings were going to be difficult to face. So I decided to go as an English comp major because I decided I wanted to be a writer, and of course you need a degree to do that. But comp one wasn't really inspiring me, and simultaneously I'm being introduced to this wonderful world of performing arts. The dance department at University of Missouri St. Louis was young, and by young I mean it had just started. <laughs> Unknowingly, I took the first dance class that they ever offered because it fulfilled a fine arts credit and it was listed as a lecture course. <laughs> it turns out all dance classes are listed as lecture courses and this was no sit in your chair and listen sort of class. I had to buy a leotard, tights, ballet slippers, the whole nine. I was apprehensive, but I made some incredible friends my first week in the program. So I also noticed I wasn't the only beginner so with nothing more than the last pick of the high school palm squad in my list of dance experience, I decided to stick with it. Now, after I took fundamentals of dance my first semester, I took modern dance my second semester. I found that I liked this style quite a bit more than jazz and ballet, and I was really starting to get excited about this dancing thing beyond the friendships that I found. But it wasn't until my third semester in when the light bulb went on. I took dance composition, and I was like, wait a minute. I can make up anything that I want at all. There's no parameters, no restrictions. And I fell in love. I immediately knew that I wanted to do choreography for the rest of my life, but I just didn't yet know that it was what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. My first professor, although a hard ass, I credit for making me a dancer. Without her strict and sometimes abusive approach, I wouldn't be where I am today. My second professor became my mentor, Rob Scoggins. Rob came to the program after about two years. He believed in me and he helped me harness my potential. Rob had a good eye for talent and he was very good at nurturing young artists. Before him, I was advised to not apply for school in California because I would never have any opportunities among the other more talented students. But after him, I was convinced that I could do anything that I wanted and I could do it well. As the first in my family to go to university, I didn't have the resources that I needed. I could have applied for several scholarships that no one educated me about, not even my academic advisors. And in addition to working multiple part-time jobs, I took out the maximum I could borrow every semester. I lived off of it. And then I graduated with an arts degree and over $100,000 in student loan debt. But honestly, I couldn't be more grateful for the experience. When I finished college, I knew that I needed an outlet to continue choreographing, so I started calling studios to see who was hiring, and I got a job teaching dance at a small studio in Maplewood. This business also accepted my offer to teach some hours in exchange um, for my time in rehearsal. So I bartered my teaching salary to start my dance company. Now at first, Consuming Kinetics Dance Company was nothing more than a club. It was just a group of my friends, adults, who all wanted to continue dancing post-college. And some of them didn't even go to school for dance. We didn't get paid or charged for our performance services. It was something that we just did because we loved it and we wanted to. But we still referred to ourselves as a dance company and used official language because fake it till you make it, right? Over time, many more adults wanted to work with us, um, but they didn't want to perform. They actually just wanted to come in and take our warm-up class before we started rehearsal. Now, back in 2009, when my project started, I didn't know of any places that you could take dance classes in St. Louis. In fact, I had even invested another two years in my education to complete the somatic certificate at Washington University under the direction of David Marchant. I didn't know of anywhere else that I could go continue to learn about or train in dance. Especially with my limited years of experience. 
Now, speaking of experience, my dad instilled a love of travel in me at a young age, and it followed me to adulthood, where I take our annual road trip out west. I enjoy the national parks, the big cities. And by 2010, I had this idea. Maybe I should look up dance companies. And sure enough, there were so many places to take dance classes out there. Everything from a studios that were established just to provide dance classes for adults to professional companies that offered a program much like CKDC does now. So the focus of my annual trip shifted. I did market research, I brought ideas back home, and I implemented them in the best way that I could with the resources that I had. As sole proprietor, I started officially offering a program of dance in 2011. And by 2012, we outgrew our little studio in Maplewood, and we moved to the Patch neighborhood. The Magic Hat was the name of the building, and it housed Melt. You guys might remember that restaurant. It later moved to the Cherokee District. The Magic Hat recruited individual artists under the direction of Jenny B. Gypsy. Now, the point was to move an artist of all trade. Textile artists, sculptors, painters, hair, makeup, dance, anything. But sadly, we noticed that our growing audience of class participants didn't want to make the trek across town to hang out in a neighborhood that we were hoping to revitalize. So what was supposed to be a move for growth ended up being proof that we needed a more central location to serve our community. And with this on my mind, I retired to my apartment in the West End every night until one night, I noticed that a Pilates studio was opening. I made connection to discover that they had built a ballroom dance floor and they were offering tango classes. So I had a look at the space and I proposed to move my business in on a sub rental agreement to add and expand to their dance programming. Once approved, all of our clients returned eventually in droves and that's when the real growth started. It was in this studio where we applied for and received our 501c3 nonprofit status. It was in this space where I humbly transitioned from owner to founder. Everything was going well until one evening without notice, our sub rental agreement was terminated. We were scheduled to have classes that evening, but we were asked to not report to the space. It was April 30th, 2015, and I affectionately refer to that as our Independence Day. See, we had long since outgrown the space, and working under the rules and the regulations of another business posed many challenges. If it weren't for being kicked out, we might have stayed under the wing of that business forever, complacent. Our name would have always been hidden under theirs, and our hard work and our effort would have always been partially credited to them. We would have been encouraged to spend our money in the way that they saw fit. In one of my favorite books, You Are a Badass, written by Jen Sincero, she says, on the other side of your fear is your freedom. And April 30th, 2015 was a turning point like none other. I had to decide if I was going to fight the good fight. Was I going to give it my all like I never had before? Take out the business loan, assume the risk, hire more employees? Which a lot of you don't know this, but even as a nonprofit, we pay a lot of taxes. The co <laughs> Some people know that. Someone in the back has a nonprofit. <laughs> the cost associated with just having one single employee is equivalent to the entire salary of just having another contractor. Was I going to work day and night and give up any social life that I had been holding on to to keep this dream afloat? Or was I going to run away to Washington? or Oregon, and live in the mountains with my people. <laughs> I was afraid of both options. <laughs> but I often say that there's only one thing that I love more than open roads and landscapes, and that's community. The people kept me here. I was feeling defeated. I didn't know which direction my life should go. But I had dozens of people reach out and say, you're not giving up. How can we help? And those weren't empty promises. These friends and qu clients quite literally followed us around St. Louis as we rented from almost four different facilities that summer. 
And I say almost four because one of the rental situations was such a bad fit for us that we had to move back to the previous renter for another month. The goal was to find an, a new home. But in the meantime, the backup plan was to just find a decent place to rent for a while in case finding a new home wasn't in the cards. Now, the cost of renting hourly was astronomical, and it quickly ate up our bank account, rendering me a period where I didn't receive a paycheck. Now, every business owner has to deal with this at some point or another, but you would hope that you're past that by your sixth year in business, or you might need to start questioning your sustainability. It was an uphill battle to say the least, but it was one worth fighting. Not to mention, it's a lot easier when you feel like you have the most powerful army marching beside you. I am not alone in my journey to make CKDC a success, as you can see, even though I'm a nerd. My dad wrote that. (laughs) The clients who asked me how can I help assisted us in the search for a new home And when we settled on one, they showed up to do carpentry work and help us build our studio floor, even if they had never done that type of work before. And I was connected to the space that we finally made our home by someone that I previously worked as director of marketing for. Achieving your deepest desires takes a village. Never underestimate the power of people. Here are some more great examples of our community. On the other end, you might find that there will be snakes in your business. You might find people that wish to get close to you for selfish reasons that aren't revealed for months or sometimes years. The ones who put your nonprofit out on the street. The ones who become too possessive of your work or copy your business plan and steal your clients. I've heard so many stories from small business owners and founders of nonprofits. You see, starting something is just not for the faint of heart. Which reminds me of my original idea about courage. Mine is invested through a feeling of support, but you can't always rely on other people to find your courage. You must have it within you, and you must constantly reevaluate who supports your passion. And you're not gonna be a perfect judge of character. You can't be overly possessive about your operations in fear of someone becoming a competitor. People may use you, and you just take all those lessons And you continue to be the example. Because all that attention really means is that you are doing something very right. Right enough that other people are noticing you and your work, and they want to be a part of it. On the wall in the bathroom of one of my favorite vegan restaurants, Sweet Art, there is a quote that says, Your life unfolds in proportion to your courage. And I believe that. I noticed that once I made my mind up, made a decision, I would relentlessly chase it until I had manifested what I was after. And now, after almost three years in our new scary location, with only $11,000 left on our build-out loan, we are still growing. We are dominating the market. We are bringing people together, and we are transforming lives. We are innovating dance in St. Louis, and we are redefining what it means to be a dancer. We are showing this city how dance can truly be immersed in a community. And we're doing it with open hearts and open minds. But not without caution. Sometimes being courageous is about saying no. Remember the people that gave you a reason to not be courageous? Stop taking their advice. Stop listening to the naysayers. Let go of toxic friendships and business relationships. Everyone will be so quick to tell you what a mistake you are making when you finally take the leap and you start following your passion and your dreams. And some of that is honest. They honestly want to protect you. And some of it is jealousy because they're not ready to take this leap. So people always refer to survivors of cancer or individual facing terminal illness as courageous. But if you ask any of these patients about courage, they will just tell you they were just normal people. Much like my mom, who fought as long as she could. She was one of the most courageous women I know. But to me, she was just my mom. And in her normalcy was her beauty. She didn't have an unusual amount of courage. It took her facing the end of her life to fight. 
but tomorrow is not guaranteed. And, and we don't always get a warning or a diagnosis to know that. So you have no other choice than to be courageous. You only have this one life to live. What do you want to do with it? Thank you so much for your time.